The core element of the trap in illusion is, undoubtedly, addiction. The first addiction is already programmed even before birth, that is, survival. The maintenance of the body in the apparently coherent form of its body parts is one thing, but another is the maintenance of the mind in the apparent cohesive and concrete identity of the I, or ego. You may argue this view, of course, and state that survival, be it bodily or mental, are not addictions but merely devices to ensure that we are able to cope with the dangers of the nature we are submerged in. That is true as well. However, I see survival as an addiction because it is going to identify not only body and mind threats, but also secondary ones. I am not talking about the identification of the threat and instinctive action of stepping away from the path of the oncoming truck, but about the defense mechanism that will identify threats to its current set of compositions, as are ideas, ideals, concepts and worldviews, and that will twist and turn any perceived threat to protect itself from damage, that is, from its own partial death. To the ego, losing a worldview is like losing a limb, because it is an emotional, animal-like construct that will exaggerate everything, be it pleasant or unpleasant, it comes in touch with. This is because the ego is a product of fear, pre-programmed fear, yes, but also one gained through indoctrination and experience. So, this defender of the construct, a mental entity generated to ensure the maintenance of the current form of the ego, is an addict. It is the primary addict of the mind, addicted to keeping things as they are. So much an addict that it will even defend the ego construct at the expense of the body's survival and health. This sustained mental state or form is then more important to it than its prolonged continuation. If it is at the expense of that form's change into anything else, this is an addiction. There is a higher reason for that addiction, as everything here tries to be an inadvertent and inadequate copy of truth, so I will come back later to this particular addiction, as first I have to put them into context. In truth, however that is, imperceptible and ineffable to our physical and mental senses as it is, there is an undoubted, irrefutable sense of belonging and placement. Our true selves, so to speak, know in truth where they fit. What they are is what they do. So that feeling of bliss, of absolute fitting and actual freedom, for doing what we are supposed to do in truth is freedom, is a true mastery that, unlike its cheap copy here in reality, which we call slavery, bears no exploitation and is, is completely voluntary. So much voluntary that nobody prevented the servant to leave that mastery and come down to this illusion, right? No slave master in this illusion would allow one of his subjects to leave without compensation. It is the difference between service, which is bliss, and slavery, which is suffering. As we leave truth and embark on this illusionary world, there is something we carry with us that remembers that bliss. Is that not what Mephistopheles tries to tell Faustus that summoned him in that excellent classical English play? Faustus asks, Where are you damned? And Mephistopheles replies, In hell. Faustus asks then, How comes it then that thou art out of hell? And Mephistopheles says, Why, this is hell, nor am I out of it. Thinkest thou that I, saw, that I who saw the face of God and tasted the eternal joys of heaven am not tormented with ten thousand hells in being deprived of everlasting bliss? Faustus, leave these frivolous demands which strike a terror to my fainting soul. So Mephistopheles tries to, to explain to Faustus that his earth, earthly desires, or that is, addictions to temptations, are what causes the fall to hell. Now, later on in the play, 
actually, after Faust signs the deed to sell his soul, he again questions, uh, um, Faustus again questions Mephistopheles on the nature of hell. This time, he goes more in depth. Faustus asks, Tell me, where is this place that men call hell? Mephistopheles says, Under the heavens? Faustus asks again, but where about? And Mephistopheles answers, within the bowels of these elements, where we are tortured and remain forever. Hell hath no limits, nor is circumscribed in one self place. For where we are is hell, and where hell is, there must we ever be. And to conclude, when all the world dissolves, and every creature shall be purified, all places shall be hell that are not heaven. Faustus disputes this. He says, Now, come, I think hell's a fable. And Mephistopheles tells, tells him, Think so still, till experience change your mind. Why thinkest thou then that Faustus shall be damned? Faustus asks. Of necessity, Mephistopheles says, For here's the scroll wherein thou hast given thy soul to Lucifer. And body too, Faustus shrugs it off. But what of that? Thinkest thou that Faustus is so fond as to imagine that after life there is pain? Tush, these are mere trifles and old wives' tales. But Mephistopheles reiterates the gravity of the situation. He tells him, Faustus, I am an instance to prove the contrary. For I am damned, and I am now in hell. But Faustus, so enamored with his already festering addictions, affirms, How now, in hell? Nay, and this be hell, I'll be willingly damned here. <laughs> what a lesson contained in this play by Christopher Marlowe, or whoever it is that wrote it. In any case, the memory of that bliss, and of the pure, unforceful, undisputed mastery to which we were at service, comes with us, despite buried deep, when we enter this illusionary creation. That memory comes to us and we taint it with our mental concepts, calling depression to the sadness that emerges from remembering its lack without being able to completely recall its absolute placement. As we feel that sadness, usually associated with the destruction of something our ego concept held dear in the worldly affairs, we have two choices. Either allow ourselves to feel it and through that sadness allow that the death of at least the partial concept of I am takes place, or to try to repel it by anesthesia or with a replacement within the senses for that sensation of blissful euphoria, of divinity if you prefer the wording. That is when addiction mostly strikes. Alcohol, drugs, sex, power, food, and even greed or accumulation of wealth for its own sake are all addictions that provide a passing and ephemeral sensation that is as close as our senses can provide to that lost bliss. But is quick to pass and quick also to cause even deeper sadness yeah. afterwards, being now not only the unconscious memory of the lost bliss, but also the guilt of having defiled its memory with such cheap copies. So the more sadness come, the more the addiction is fed to shut it out temporarily. The addiction then becomes the new master, a fallen, a, a false imitation and substitute for that pure mastery we remember but cannot place. And the superficial and ephemeral bliss it provides us, more a relief than anything else, becomes a false replacement for that bliss we also recall, but are unable to locate within. Coming back now to the defender of the ego forms, even at the expense of the body's health that I mentioned at the start of this uh, contemplation. This addict mental device tries to attain and maintain that blissful service to a pure mastery whose memory is latent deep down tries to do so by protection of the addiction, which is, in its limited perception, the best it can get. 
it protects the addiction in the same way our true selves would now protect our pure service if we were in what they call heaven or truth, now that we know better by having experienced the hell of its absence. Now that defense mechanism that protects all kinds of addiction here serves, however, another master, one that is stated in John Milton's masterpiece. Let me quote. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell. Receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he, whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free, that Almighty hath not built. Here for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worthy ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Truth will serve us as we serve truth. It will never enslave us. It will never demand of us strict obedience, but mere retraction from falsehood and reawakening to its own irrefutable essence. So irrefutable that when you reawaken to its indirect understanding, for our senses are limited, you will immediately see illusions for what they are and lose interest in them. The addict becomes redeemed. <laughs>